everyone, you are listening to the Maitri podcast between friends, conversations with Maitri. This is your host, Nandini Ray, and today I'm very, very excited to have Shamita Das Dasgupta on our show. This is an opportunity for us to honor a bold activist who is working relentlessly in the South Asian gender justice movement. Samita is an Indian scholar and an exemplary role model for many of us, many activists. Uh, she co-founded Manavi, the first organization in the in United States dedicated to ending all forms of violence against South Asian women. Uh, Shamita is also an author, researcher, and the recipient of many awards. Uh, she sits on the board of uh, several na national organizations. Welcome, Shamita Di. It's my honor to host you on our show. Thank you so much, Nandini. I'm so pleased to be here. So uh, when I was reading about you, I, um, I saw that you uh, came to this country um, in the 80, uh, 80s, around 80s, in an, as an immigrant. And at that time, our South Asian community, our community was not that aware of this gender justice movement or um, or many of us, like South Asian community as a whole, not, were, they were not involved in raising awareness about the issue of uh, violence against women. While most immigrants, um, when they come here, they spend time and energy in, in adjusting with new people, new system, new even new weather. And but you at the time invested your time and energy in building uh, this South Asian gender justice movement. So what motivated you to work in this field? If I may correct you a little, Nundini, um, I came to this country in the uh, late 60s. Oh. Yeah, way long, donkeys years ago. So you can imagine how old I am. <laughs> I came here um, and went, did my undergraduate and up to the graduate studies in this country. Um, I, was, I got married very early, young. Uh, and so um, I uh, followed my husband who was who came to this country to uh, finish his PhD. Mm. So I followed him uh, and I had just been out of school at that time, uh, just finished my high school. Uh, I did my undergraduate uh, in this country. I had my daughter here uh, mm. and I, as I was raising her, I finished my education. So it's, it was a long time, but um, this was the late 60s and 70s, really. I mean, I was a year before 70 was on. So, um, so in the uh, 70s, the feminist movement in this country was very strong and the civil rights movement. So there were a lot of social changes that were going on. Mm. And of course, I, uh, it kind of answered all the questions I had while I was growing up in India about poverty, about uh, marginalization, about women's status. I had questions, but I had no answers. And for the first time, I, it, it kind of clicked all of these various uh, justice movements, social justice movements that were going on. So I became very involved with um, feminist groups on campus. Uh, I, um, you know, and particularly uh, about uh, violence against women. Uh, and one of the things that we recognize that that is one aspect that is common all over the world for women. Uh, and it is also, not only it's just common, but it does, it, it thwarts women's development. Mm -hmm. And uh, women cannot go forward because of the experience of violence in their lives, particularly intimate violence. So, um, you know, uh, I was kind of, we were talking about it, thinking with my feminist friends. And when I moved in the early 80s, I moved to New Jersey. Oh. Met, yes, that's, I think that's what you're referring to. When I was reading about you, I saw that, you know, 80s, she started the movement. Yes. And, yes. Okay. Yeah. But there's a lot of preparatory time before okay. that. <laughs> I um, met with five other wonderful feminists, South Asian feminists, who were all kind of talking about uh, what's happening in our community with women, um, you know, 
we need to know what's going on. So some of us were just out of graduate school. Some of us were still in it, a filmmaker. Uh, so all of these women came together and we said, well, let's find out about what's going on in our community. And in 1981, there was a horrendous incident that happened in New Jersey. A very young woman, a mother of two, um, killed her husband and was arrested for the murder. Mm. The story she told in court mm. was of her, the awful abuse she faced, she and her children faced day in and day out. Uh, and um, it, it was for the first time the community became aware of this, um, that there's something else going on. Yeah. Right at that time, remember, it was a new community, South Asian community was new, it was forming, everybody was getting settled and they were raising children. So new and every and it was very successful community right it was. Um, it, it was financially it was very successful, you know, people were buying homes and they were advancing in their career, so this was the first time they realized there may be something else going on. And for us, the six women who were feminists and who were thinking about women's lot, um, it was, we were all like, what exactly is happening that such an incident could happen in our community? And nobody was aware of it, that this woman was experiencing such abuse. What is going on? The filmmaker who was in our group wanted to do a movie about it film about it, um, but um, you know, somehow it, it didn't, it fizzled out, it didn't happen. But we thought maybe we should look into, all six of us, look into the status of women within our community. From that point, that is the formation of Manavi, that's the initial formation of Manavi. But once we formed, immediately women started calling us, and saying that, look, I'm experiencing abuse in, um, in my life. And I know you're a South Asian women's group. Why don't you do something about it? And we kind of said, OK, forget about the scholarly activities and research. We need to really respond to these issues. So that's where we started. We, there was no model for us. Uh, the, even the mainstream movement was very young and they had no idea about, um, it, you know, it was mainly white women yeah. driven movement. It, there was no awareness of what is happening in uh, people of color communities, um, particularly immigrants, new immigrants. So we didn't get much support from there, although I think I hounded them often, often to get some response. Uh, however, that's where we started. And uh, we said, well, you know, we need to think about it and do something about it. And the need is still exist. Um, so uh, what I was thinking that, you know, you have uh, been working in this field for a long time and uh, you are, you are, you know, witnessing uh, the, the how the movement goes and everything so um and i you probably have noticed some changes um in our community uh, in terms of um gender um justice gender inequality um in in terms of you know women's status so what are the changes you have been noticing in terms of women facing inequality and oppression in, in our community, in, in the South Asian communities? Um, it's, that's a complex question. I have to tell you that uh, when we started, and, and I think this is the biggest change that has happened also, when we started, uh, the community was very skeptical, um, very uh, kind of annoyed with us that we were airing dirty laundry in public, um, that this, is, uh, this doesn't happen in our community, that was a uh, one-time incident, uh, things like that, or, or this is rather than a common uh, experience of women, this was a you know, one-time experience that women may be in, at fault for some of these. So there was a lot of those kinds of skepticism, 
women blaming uh, issues that, uh, that happened. And it was assumed that these things should be kept hidden. Hmm. Biggest change I've seen in the community, and I have to say, it's not just Manavi, it's all the wonderful, absolutely dedicated South Asian groups that have come about, women's groups. I think there are more than two dozen now around the country. Mm -hmm. uh, and how much they have put in, put efforts into doing this, that the discourse has become public from a very private, you know, hush hush nobody should speak about this to know this is something we acknowledge and we should do something about it uh, it's no longer a matter of shame of the woman mm. who is being abused but it, it the the community i wouldn't say it's 100 percent, but definitely a strong uh, trend in the community is to um, say that we need to take responsibility we need to do something about it um, and really, the discourse has come from private to public. The other thing that I see, <clears throat> I used to really see women suffering for 20 years, 25 years before they came out and talked. Mm. I think there is um, there is a lot less time they are ready to accept it, accept abuse, intimate partner abuse. They are more likely to say, OK, I've give it, given it a try and let's move on, or I should do something about it, that I'm not to be blamed. I find that to be absolutely so courageous and uh, wonderful that women can do that. And I have to say that I really uh, pay tribute to all the women's organizations, uh, South Asian women's organizations for doing that, to, to bring, bring this about. Yeah. I think for me, um, I also get very excited when I see that South Asian girls are, um, you know, girls and women from our community, they are uh, breaking barriers that patriarchal culture, cultural conditions um, created for us. Um, and as you said, that many organizations, they are making this, they are you know, bringing this issue on a public platform so that people are maybe more aware. But on the other hand, uh, we are still seeing women are, you know, getting raped, uh, abused, killed um, helplessly at their um, own homes and by their partners or family members. And uh, in 2022, last year, one year alone, we saw that, you know, we suffered the loss of so many women from our community to uh, disturbing acts of gender-based violence. And uh, not only it is happening in different South Asian countries, but also it's happening in the in the United States and in here in our community, where people, many community members think that they are, we are progressive, we are um, we are you know model minority, but still it is happening. That is um, that is very disturbing, and uh, hopefully one day uh, we will see some changes. Um, but Shamitadi, you are the you are one of the uh, first uh, South Asian activist to address uh, uh, the transnational nature of the work that needed to be done um, in addressing uh, the various challenges mm -hmm. that uh, that immigrant survivors um, both they are they're suffering uh, in 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 here in this country as well as in uh, in their home countries almost until the 2000 and there's a, there's a reason for it let me come to that again, that we were not aware of abandonment of women as a form of violence. And in, in a sense, globalization, as it happened, brought on this. Uh, remember that violence hasn't gone away, right? Like violence against women. It just changes shapes and forms mm -hmm. as circumstances change. So there are always new forms of violence that, that, is being, uh, that emerges. Uh, and uh, particularly in the immigrant community, we know of immigration abuse that happened. Mm -hmm. Now, when globalization happened, people were moving from one country to other for work reasons, for various other uh, issues, uh, tourism, um, work, you know, it, it was kind of flourishing. And uh, particularly men in our community moved from one uh, place to another, one country to another. As they moved and their partners 
uh, followed them or were together or maybe not followed them. They, uh, the, the violence that happened was, uh, among other things, by the way, there was, there was no abating of uh, physical violence and emotional violence, but added to it was this idea of abandoning the woman, just letting her be. Uh, without resources, without emotional resources, financial resources, legal resources, she was abandoned. And um, I, for, for the first time I became aware, I was a little bit aware of it from uh, reading newspaper reports, but not to the extent that I was later on. In, I think, 2005 or six, I was uh, asked by the um, in a particular institute in this country to uh, do some consulting work with them in Punjab. Mm -hmm. the, in the Punjab, the Punjab, uh, a whole bunch of um, the top leaders of Punjab police uh, a year or two years before that came to this country to do to get some training. Mm -hmm. And one of the pieces they, um, one of their training was with Manavi. So they were, uh, they came to us and they met me and we provided them a whole day training uh, on violence against women, et cetera. They went back and they kind of asked me to go uh, oh. there. So I did uh, with uh, this, in, another woman from a particular institute. And uh, once we were there and we were moving around in different areas of Punjab, there were local people who were coming to see us and visit us. Mm -hmm. I found that, you know, the, the majority of them were um, women who came, whose husbands have abandoned them in the country. They've come to uh, America and, or they've gone off to United Kingdom, somewhere, Australia, whatever that might be, Middle East um, for work. And, uh, basically, they were they. Some of them were holiday brides, which is the men would go back for holidays and live with them, mm -hmm. and then just leave them without resources. Uh, some of them were deliberately married so that the, when the men left, the the women would be looking after the um, in, -laws. After in laws. Yeah, yeah, all elderly in laws, and with the constant promise of oh, this time I go back, I'll bring you. To, um, to me uh, in the foreign country, but that never happened. And some of them were just left alone. Um, maybe the, the in-laws, the woman's parents provide a dowry, mm -hmm. which helped them travel to this country, or maybe you know they came here and they changed their mind, whatever that might be. The women were left without resources. Mm -hmm. And so many of them came to talk to me to say, we need to trace, you know, they were like in limbo. We need to trace our husbands. What's our status? What's going to happen to us? Uh, and they were fathers of women mm. who came with the women, their daughters, their grandchildren, and saying that this child has never seen the father. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, she, we don't get, uh, she doesn't get any support, financial support from him. So what's going to happen? And the women were basically leading lives of um, servitude, mm. abandonment and servitude. That really started hitting me. I said, that this is ridiculous. Um, and abandonment has to be taken as violence, particularly when, uh, a person's survival is dependent on another from whom uh, it is expected that the, the person will support this person emotion, if not emotionally, at least financially. Yeah. And it didn't happen, mm -hmm. wasn't happening. And I started looking into it, um, doing, uh, you know, first of all, we needed to write it up, we needed to document it, and I did that with a, a young colleague at, who was working at Manavi at that time, uh, Urjashi Rudra, and uh, we uh, wrote an occasional paper on it, pretty, pretty uh, comprehensive, I would say, uh, looking at international laws, because, because of this kind of uh, movement, Mm. transnational movement, no one country's laws 
affected or, or could have uh, jurisdiction over this these, this couple because one was in let's say India or Pakistan the other was in America mm -hmm. which law are we talking about so there are some international laws that needed to be looked yeah. in so we did all of that um, and then um, th there's a there's a network named Aman mm -hmm. led by Swayam in Kolkata mm -hmm. uh, which is a South Asian network all over the all over uh, the I would say the world um, and we became quite we collaborated with them so mm -hmm. if there is a woman who needs to tra trace somebody here we would help them trace uh, the partner through um, the intimate partner through uh, consulate uh, we made some connections with the consulate we let women who were coming for the first time to know that if you get into trouble, who do you talk to? Who do you call? Developing some small brochures for them, so mm -hmm. on and so forth. So these were the practical things. And one part is research. The other part is actually providing those resources to women. Yeah. So uh, do you have any suggestion for our uh, community members? So how can they prevent? First of all, you speak, you talk you um, look for policies, you look, you know, you support the woman. Uh, it, it's you know, sometimes, the, um, a lot of times, you'll find that the women just want the marriages to be restored, which may not be able, we may not be able to do that. So we tell them that, no, we cannot do that. But what we can do is to see if you can be provided for, financially provided for, that's about all we can could do, but that is also important. Mm -hmm. uh, and so as, as community members, I think some of those things, recognition, I think is the first thing that needs to be done. Recognition, standing by the person, standing by the, in, in this case, the victim at that point, we don't even know how she's going to survive, who doesn't know how she would survive. And to see if there are, they're putting pressure on policymakers to do something about it, to change it, on lawmakers to say there needs to be a law supporting abandoned women, abandoning, abandoned uh, uh, to the point that they cannot survive. So um, at least those, and again, I would say don't do it alone, do it in collaboration with the women's group that's close to you. Um, one of the things that I found in this country when I was talking about abandonment, the mainstream organization couldn't really understand it. And mm -hmm. they were like, oh, why is this violence? Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I mean, we did talk about it, but I'm not sure that the mainstream movement quite gets uh, the, 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 the magnitude of the problem mm -hmm. and understands the problem, particularly because it's so culturally woven. Uh, to a woman's survival. If you are sending your daughters or sisters to this country, and then they should know the resources. But you can imagine when a new newlywed woman is coming to this country, she doesn't want to hear I'm going to be in trouble, yes, or yes. she doesn't want to hold on to that. So again, um, you know, but she, she should know where you can find it at least. Find it, yeah. So if consulate can, you know, every all the countries consulate, they can provide that information. That I think um, is good. Um, it's, it's such a, you know, a very, very tragic incident people are going through. I mean, women are going through when they're abundant. Either locally, some, some clients we have, we saw that they're abundant in here, in the apartment building. Uh, not only transnational, but they're here, but they don't know where the husband is. It is sad. I mean, there is so many problems interconnected like uh, you know we are not helping our daughters to get educated or have the like uh, power or thinking ability to that no i don't i'm not less than anybody any anyone uh, so that kind of uh, awareness we our community members probably need to do um, this is my biggest peeve of everything, 
I would love for the South Asian parents to not to say, oh, just kind of adjust to their women. Yeah. To say, no, you deserve justice. Yes. You deserve support. You deserve love and care. I'm not just one-sided, but just as much, you know, you give care and you accept care. Yeah. You should be both sides. And to say, we are there for you. Yes. We are there and we will support you. Yeah. And many South Asian parents probably don't say that. They already... You know, they are in a mindset that, oh, if my daughter uh, is living in a relationship, probably it will be, uh, we will face community ostracism. So let's, uh, if what people will say, I mean. Yeah, that is, that the, is a very really big problem. Yeah. Log kya kahenge? Kahenge, yeah. Loke, loke ki bol be. Ki These bol. are the issues. Um, that's very important. But uh, more than that, this is your daughter. Yes. Yes, uh, you support her. Yeah, their safety should be, you know, most important. Foremost. Um, that should be foremost on in your mind. Yeah. We are just saying the main thing that your children's safety should be the uh, prime concern uh, for you. So that's the thing. One thing I uh, I want to, you know, talk about that uh, we last year we did, uh, we published a magazine, Maitri magazine. It's called Udan. And so uh, it's actually um, all, you know, most staff members, uh, our, our volunteers, our um, the women we serve, uh, we all actually took part in, um, in, um, in creating this magazine. And um, it was part of our actually self-care routine because during COVID time, all of us were like going through a lot of you know, stress, emotion, uh, not you know, negative emotions, stress. So they, this this was this activity was part of our self care routine. So, uh, and we we use different art forms uh, to express our feelings. Uh, some of us wrote poetry um, or short stories. Some of us uh, created beautiful drawings, um, shared recipes, um, and we feel that art is uh, a powerful form of individual expression. That's why at Maitri we. Um, we do a uh, annual art fest for youth so that they can and so and we ask them that you know uh, create uh, any art form to focus on the four elements of healthy relationship that is love compassion and peace um and uh, i think that you also used art form in various ways for uh, you no know, community engagement or uh, you also feel like this is a part is a powerful tool for you know, engaged community members in advocacy. So how are you using art for? You're absolutely correct. Art is, you know, any uh, it, actually art is a thousand words, right? Better than thousand words. Just pictures. Uh, can give you a better understanding of the situation. Mm -hmm. So yes, um, definitely. I mean, look at almost every movement has posters, which is expression, right? That's a very strong expression. And I think um, that is true that poetry, art, uh, paintings, whatever that might be, even, um, you know, what's called gorilla, gorilla knitting and crocheting, those are all uh, beautiful ways of expressing and uh, fighting for justice, struggling mm -hmm. to achieve justice. So yes, um, that is important. I personally happen to be a terrible, uh, you know, in art. I just don't have any abilities, um, but I write. I've uh, written always um, poetry and, uh, you know, for last so many years, I've been writing um, uh, stories, no novellas, novels, and short stories. Um, in Bangla, particularly. This is the creative part. The academic part, of course, I write in English, which is um, not something that, that endures me to everybody. But this is something that I've been doing and getting published in uh, Kolkata, in, in Bengal. Mm -hmm. And mostly, I do seem to pick up, because that's part of, very big part of my life, about women's issues. Uh, you know, it's, I write detective stories, by the way, a lot, and uh, but they all seem to um, 
kind of uh, center around uh, a, a particular women's issues, maybe abandonment, maybe rape, maybe domestic violence, maybe something else, but always in a kind of a marginalized community. Um, mm -hmm. There is something that is happening. You are, so, you are using art form in, in a very creative way to, you know, in raising awareness, in educating your community members. And by the way, you ask us how, how um, terrific you are in this, <laughs> not terrible, terrific you are in this. <laughs> in this. Really. I can't, you know, I wish I, I knew. Music, by the way, is a wonderful way of raising awareness. Uh, and I'm bad at both art, uh, you know, any kind of paintings or music. I just don't know. Uh, I mean, hey, everyone is not good at, cannot be good at everything, right? <laughs> no, no. I'm not good at, but I try. So I write. Uh, you know, that's one way. But I would suggest that you, you know, you brought up something beautiful, um, and and so glad that my three is doing it. This should be a, an annual event that not just because of COVID. But to to yeah, we are trying. We are actually the Art Fest, Youth Art Fest is an annual event. It is um, we are doing this for last seven years, I would say. Uh, and seven years every year, we are seeing wonderful submissions from young artists and young community members from our community. And every year, it is like it's so heartwarming to see how young people are. Uh, talking about love, peace, and compassion through their arts. And for Udan, uh, this uh, magazine, we are planning to do uh, every year. And um, the first, uh, first one is published, and we got a lot of community attention for that uh, magazine. And hopefully, we will be doing it again this year. Again, I was, you know, reading about you, and I, I noticed that you worked on transnational surrogacy in India. So would you play, you know, please share some things in your work uh, with our audience. Um, and I was, when I was like uh, reading that uh, about you and uh, transnational surrogacy, um, um, you know, in my mind, I was again uh, seeing that exploiting women, especially women from marginalized groups. Uh, so do you think the same way? Do you think this is another way of exploiting women, especially marginalized women? Right. Um, I have to acknowledge that uh, really surrogacy is an issue uh, that was, um, you know, I knew about it. And I, again, kind of like thinking about it. But my daughter, who's a physician and who, again, is very much um, in working on healthcare and justice, justice and, and healthcare issues, um, she brought it to me. And we uh, can put wrote a num couple, number of articles on it and then um, a, a book compiled a book publish uh, the book in this country on surrogacy. Mm -hmm. Surrogacy, as you know, uh, in India, the way it was formed was um, it was the hub of uh, surrogacy or, or pregnancy done for other people, right, uh, carrying their child from mm -hmm. all over the world. People went in there because it was cheap, and it was um, there was uh, uh, good medical care avail available, um, you know, so on and so forth. So I won't get into that more. But the women who were coming forward to do it are poor women, right? Mm. Very, very poor women, and the poor women, and it was uh, they they were being paid to do this. I'm not saying, you know, I, I have a lot of difficulty in thinking about whether it's wrong or right, because it was something that a lot of time women were pushed to do it from the family. Sometimes they did it. Be, and But much of the time, we found that women were not doing it for their own benefit, but the, for the family's benefit. You know, I need a daughter to be married off. Mm -hmm. uh, my husband needs... Uh, um, heart surgery. Am uh, I, uh, you know, mother and father-in-law needs to buy land for farming. So the women were kind of pushed into, or they themselves were uh, encouraged to um, be surrogates for others, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but not for their own gain. 
So again, women were pushed into the same role of doing something for others by not only giving their mind, but their body. Um, unfortunately, we also found tremendous abuse within that, you know, women, they were promised some, uh, some amount of money which they didn't get fully. Uh, there was no follow-up checkups on them. So the healthcare was spotty for them. As long as they were pregnant up to the point of giving birth, they were taken care of, meaning that they were kind of um, corralled <laughs> in, uh, in a hostel, uh, etc. But once that happened, once they gave up, there was no uh, support or a care given to them emotionally, uh, psychological uh, care, uh, emotional uh, support, and physical health care that was they were deprived of that because you know they were being again used as a vessel and that was it um, I think I legally it's no longer um, available in India you can nobody can from outside can go in but of course as you know we all know the underground is going on right this kind of um, uh, this surrogacy is still going on. Uh, again, I would have said that the, um, I would have recommended that the um, policies should have been tougher on how the women are treated, what kind of a health care they are given, rather than saying, okay, stop everything, uh, because a lot of women then go underground and even end up being more abused. Um, it is, it's a, it's a sticky ground. And to say that stop all surrogacy, I don't know if that'll ever work because once you open the bottle, the genie's out, to put it back again is very difficult. Um, but you can at least could have had good regulations to support the women. And I don't think that's what happened. The India government took the easy route of saying all surrogacy foreign surrogacy is stopped, but within the country surrogacy is going on. So what is going on there? We don't know because of the regulations, it's all gone underground now. We don't, hear, at least for a time we were hearing people, yeah. you know, people yeah. talking about it or women complaining or women saying I didn't get enough, the money I was promised. But it's, it's, a, it's you know, these are all really sticky and mostly Unfortunately, policymakers don't ask women, what would you like? I mean, yes. Bring them in to the same table, oh. listen to them, talk to them, find out, not to do policies from top down, and you know, gather data from bottom up, know women's lives. Yes, uh, and it happened and, you know, globally, wherever policymakers globally, wherever they are making any policies, any laws that can affect women's lives, they should you know, bring women at the same table. You are absolutely right. Yes. Yeah. Um, and at least uh, you are writing, you are talking about these issues and, uh, and hopefully one day, like we will see some, some good policies um, in place and we all know that if we want to make an effective and healthy movement, uh, then advocates alone cannot uh, do that. Advocates alone cannot bring uh, any change. So we must engage all community members um, yes. and policymakers because we need that collective force to bring any new uh, change. So um, I know that I. I wish I could continue this conversation for another uh, yeah, hour, but you know, time is a factor. I don't. I know how busy you are. So, if you, if I'm asking you that, um, do you want to share any message uh, with our listeners on how they can take part in ending gender-based violence um, and abuse? Then, what will be your message to them? Thank you, by the way, it's just, it's just wonderful. I wish I could continue the conversation for hours with you. Uh, it's really uh, exhilarating to talk to young advocates like you. 
So two things. One, I want to salute the uh, movement as it has formed now, the organizations, the young people who are dedicated to justice, dedicated to the community. I think that's, uh, it just makes me, makes my heart fill with joy when mm -hmm. I see that um, and how they have changed and how they're dedicated to bring social change about. The one message that I strongly will bring to the community, support marginalized people. Mm -hmm. People who you have left outside of your core circle, inner circle, are your children and your community members and your brothers and sisters. Bring them in. Bring them in. Listen to them. Ray you know, enhance their voices. Uh, don't, don't make uh, policies, don't stereotype them, ask them what they would like, support them, bring about social justice. Is, justice just doesn't happen. You have to struggle for it. You have to fight for it. You have to engage every day of your life in that struggle. Every time you hear a joke, putting down uh, a, a, a trans person, say no to that. Ta every time you hear uh, a joke about women's bad driving, stand up to that. Say no, even if it is in a party and large group, mm -hmm. not something you must. We must stop that. And I, I know that it has it is changing. Yeah. But, uh, you know, like, I think all advocates, we are impatient. Like, we want it to happen even more quickly. But um, again, support your local women's organization. Come out to their rallies, uh, whatever, you know, you, if you can be on their board, if you can be a volunteer, um, if you can, you know, do any kind of uh, voicing of uh, issues that are important to you. Uh, do that. Bring about that change. Support your daughters. Support their decisions to be independent and um, uh, bring about justice, equality and justice. Those must be our mantra. Wonderful. So thank you so much, Shamitadi, for coming to our show and sharing your knowledge, your experience and work with us. Um, thank you for making a strong foundation for this movement, uh, for this movement building. Uh, and I am honored. I'm honored to be part of this wonderful discussion with you. Um, your story will inspire many of our listeners. Um, I'm 100% sure about that, to join this movement uh, to end uh, violence against women. So thank you. Thank you, Nandini, so much. And uh, to all your listeners. Uh, this wonderful work you're doing. I'm so impressed. Thank you. Listeners, this episode is giving us a very good idea of the beginning of the South Asian movement um, in ending gender-based violence, violence against women, where we are now at this movement and where we need to go. So please share this episode widely with your friends, families, networks, so that they know what is going on. And this is your host, Nandini Ray, signing off today. Keep listening to the Maitri podcast between friends, conversations with Maitri. Find all our episodes on YouTube, SoundCloud, Apple, Google, Spotify, wherever you find your podcast. We will come back soon. Till then, stay safe and stay happy. Thank you. This show is for informational purposes only and is not to be construed as legal advice. Always consult an attorney for legal advice. Views expressed by guests of the radio show are individual opinions and not endorsed by Maitri. This project was made possible by funding provided by Santa Clara County Office of Gender-Based Violence Prevention.